Hall of Famer Chris Carter. What's up? Yeah, welcome back. Welcome, welcome. Nick Wright, looking good to see today. you. You as well, Ebony. Ebony, I have to apologize. I'm going to tell you, it's Friday, uh -huh. and 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 this guy on Fridays now he gets a little out of control. Uh -huh. So I'm just uh, hold on to your seat. We'll be good on that side good of the table. See. That's well, see. TGIF fellas. Thank God it is Friday. Coming up live in our studio, NBA champ Kevin Love. Also, LeBron James apparently knows who he wants to have as his coach. Oh, there's no doubt. But we're starting with last night's playoff action. All right, Sixter, Sixers, Raptors, game three. Now, if you're one of those people wondering if Joel Embiid's knee or that stomach bug were going to be an issue, don't worry about it. The big man went off for a game high 33 points, 10 boards, and five blocks. The Philly crowd serenading Embiid with MVP champs. Now the Sixers won big, 116 to 95, to take the 2-1 series lead. Chris Carter, how were the Sixers able to just blow out the Raptors last night? Well, this is what um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, pass it off here. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna something. pass it off. What, what do they say as far as my time? I'm gonna oh, I, I'll oh yield, yield my time to yield. that yes. senator. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 I've been watching a lot of TV and, I, and everything. You and I were talking about something before the show <laughs> that I wanted to make this point initially. So I appreciate you giving me this. Which and is, I don't think anyone has been more pro Philly at their best because you do this thing, and then you're a weird guy. Best but versus smart. best. Yes, like when a team yeah. or when a player plays at its best versus another team, team at their best. best. Yes. And so okay. this was the Philly team that I've been waiting for all year. Mm. This was the Philly team that I, granted I didn't know they were going to have Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris, but the Philly team that when I, before the season, picked them to go to the NBA Finals. That once they added those players, I was even more emboldened, even despite what Boston, or what fit Milwaukee was doing and what Toronto was doing, what Boston maybe one day could do, was even more emboldened that Philly would go to the NBA Finals. But the Philly team that I had to at some point abandon because we just weren't seeing this. And what this was, was Joel Embiid seemingly fully healthy, fully emboldened and fully given the reins of this team to dominate a basketball game in under 30 minutes on both ends of the court. Mm -hmm. This was a Philly team where when you had all five starters out there, you had no good options. You had no, okay, we'll let him beat us. Jimmy Butler was playing both ends extraordinarily. Mm -hmm. JJ Redick and Tobias Harris were hitting open shots and Ben Simmons was doing Ben Simmons things, particularly on the defensive end. And Joel Embiid was a world destroyer. Now, we only saw this starting lineup together 10 times in the regular season. Now, we've only seen them together 17 times total. And I still have some trepidation that they, can they duplicate this? Can they do this two more times to beat the Toronto Raptors? A Raptors team that I thought, see, going into last night, despite having lost home court, was still in full control of this series. I no longer can say the Raptors are in full control after the beatdown Philly put on them, but can Philly repeatedly do this? Because if they can, they not only can beat the Raptors, this version of the Sixers, the best version of the Sixers, can beat anybody. Yeah, and if we have the answer to two questions, and if those questions are what I think that you would say them to be, number one is Joel Embiid and his overall health. Mm. Not only health, but his weight and his overall energy. Because when you've missed the amount of time that he has missed since the All-Star break, it's impossible to be a seven-footer. We have seen seven-footers struggle not only with injuries, but with their cardio once they come back to the game. There is a certain weight that he should play at. And right now, he's not at that weight, but last night, you could see that the knee was not giving him the trouble that we've seen um, in the, the postseason thus far. And he did warn us. I'm going to figure out Mark Gasol. Just give me a little bit of time. And in last night's game, you can see that. And if their bench, Joel Embiid's health, and if their bench continues to play like this to be able to help them out, they got a little bit of boost last night by having Mike Scott back into the lineup. He didn't have a great game, but it's comforting to know that you have him. Um, James Ennis the third, man, he has been spectacular in the last couple games. They haven't even had J.J. Redick to play spectacular. Nope. Tobias is getting back into the swing of things. So they are a dangerous team. But the thing is, how consistent can a young team be with the limited amount of time, Nick, that they have spent? Where they're the gelling as we, as we speak. We're, we're seeing them play. This should be, that you should play your 18th game as a starting lineup together before Christmas. Well before Christmas. I mean, last night was their 17th. The other element of this series that I need to admit that I may have misdiagnosed was how deep is Toronto really? 
when well, DeLon Wright and C.J. Miles go out the door in the Mark Gasol trade along with Jonas Valanciunas. When O.J. on Anobi, it has an emergency appendectomy as their best reserve and now he's them. not there. Yes. And when Fred Van Vliet has been just terrible this series. Uncomfortable in the court. Right, and Serge Ibaka, who was having a resurgent year, is having a bad postseason. Well, now we're at five reserves. Two that got traded away, one that's playing poorly, one that had an appendectomy, and one that has not shown up yet to the series. So now all of a sudden, Philly's biggest weakness, their bench, if the benches can play each other even, then it's all on Kawhi Leonard to be even more brilliant than mm -hmm. he's been through three games. And go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, no, 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 I had a question. Um, you said you're a little bit trepidatious, even though this, what you saw last mm -hmm. night is lights out Philadelphia team. Chris, you mentioned they're being young, right? Mm -hmm. These young guys, super talented. I want to know from both of y'all, where's the mindset after that type of blowout game? Are they more likely to feel themselves, feel really confident, and duplicate it to, to prove Nick's point? Or are they more likely to, to start feeling themselves too much? Do they now get the big head and get their feet off the gas? Well, this is the thing. If you look at the players and you listen to them in the press conferences, I believe it's really important, especially in Philly, to listen to Jimmy Butler. Mm -hmm. Because he's the guy, you know, he's got a volatile personality, but... These young guys seem to listen to him. Ben Simmons is great because you don't hear him say a whole bunch. So now it's a matter of Joel Embiid. And if you go back to a couple of the press conferences early in the playoffs, when Jimmy Butler started sitting next to Joel Embiid, Joel Embiid looked over there and said, he's here to make sure I don't say anything. <laughs> you know, so he is the mature person. So I believe it's become important that these younger players Look to Jimmy for his leadership. I believe that Jimmy, in games two and three, has helped stabilize not only this franchise, but he's helped grab this series where they can gain control of it. So I believe a lot of that is leaning on Jimmy. Are they going to continue to lean on Jimmy Butler? And that's been the biggest difference to me. And Jimmy in Butler is empowering Joel Embiid on the court as well. If you saw the mic'd up segment that was great. in last night's game, he is telling Joel Embiid, shoot it. Shoot it. If it's an open three, shoot it. And then tell, talking to him on the bench, telling him to shoot it. So now, on the Toronto side, here's the other thing that's happened. A team that thrived this year without Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi was extraordinary, but they were able to... He missed 22 games with load management, mm -hmm. and they were able to play well in those games. They, they weren't as good without him, obviously, right. but they were fine. They now, all of a sudden, look like... Cavs teams when LeBron goes to the bench in the years past, which was all the work that LeBron and company did while he was on the court, all gets undone in a three-minute rest, a four-minute rest. The on-court, off-court number C from the regular season. Look at the offensive rating in the regular season without quiet. It's not as good as with, but it's 106.8. It's fine. And then the first round, it drops to 77. And so far this round, it's 54. It's less than half of what it is with them on the court. So this is what I'm going to say to Kawhi Leonard, who is playing like one of the three, not one of the five, one of the three best players in basketball in an argument as the best player in basketball. He's got to be able to play moving forward in this series like LeBron would have to. 42 to 44 minutes a night. Mm. I, th I They have rested him up to this point in the season to prepare him for it. He is in the athletic prime of his career. He seems fully over that injury. It is incredible. Nobody in the playoffs right now is being asked to do that. Steph and KD don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. They're not even asking Harden to do it. Giannis isn't being asked to do it. Right now, at least in game four, which becomes a, basically a must-win game for Toronto, Kawhi needs to go into that game. Nick Nurse needs to go into that game saying, we're going to play, we're going to rest Kawhi for two minutes at the end of the first quarter, two minutes at the end of the third quarter, and he's going the other 44 because Toronto doesn't have an answer offensively with him on the bench. Yeah, I think it's important that no one else besides LeBron has been able to do that. So we need to be careful as far as the expectations that we put on other players. LeBron was in that situation, and the numbers indicated that the Cavs were bad. Toronto just started getting bad with Kawhi off the sure. court. With Kawhi on the bench because it's not just a... Kawhi on the bench. In this series, they're shooting 24% when he's on the bench. So it's not as if they're not getting shots. Right. They're just not making those shots. So that's got to be one of the adjustments moving forward. If they're going to gain the home court back, build a win in Philly on Sunday, they got to be able to shoot the ball better. And that's what I was hoping in last night's blowout. In those last five minutes where they had the reserves in there, 
I was hoping Van Fleet was going to get a couple to go in. Serge Ibaka to get a couple buckets right. to go in. But they didn't. So I can understand. Yes, Kawhi last night, I think he played 36 minutes. I would try to bump that up between 37 to 40. But I would be careful with the LeBron James as far as putting anyone in that 43 to 45 minute category. And just real quick, to Nick Nurse's credit, Kawhi last night would have played 40 plus if it wasn't a blowout. Yes. You know, he was on pace to play 40 plus. I think they got to recognize that has to be the expectation for game four. You win game four, you can go back to a regular rotation, but game four becomes a must win game for Toronto. All right, can't wait to see it all go down on Sunday. But coming up, are the Warriors suddenly a bit vulnerable now with Steph Curry's finger issue? That's next on FS1. And remember, you can always check us out on the Fox Sports channel on Sirius XM. We'll be right back. You always have a finger issue with the Warriors. What? No, no. Well, oh, I see. Okay, Similar finger. Easy.